Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. This is episode 111 of the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and in this show, I'll help you get ready for the year ahead. Hey there, wonderful teachers. How is your life right now? I really mean it. How is it going? This has been a very interesting year so far for many of us. For all of us in the world, I should say. And it's not done yet. However, we are about to start a new academic year. And so I wanted to take this episode to talk about the considerations when it comes to starting a new school year, which we are in this hemisphere, and some things you can do to get yourself set up right and make for a successful year ahead no matter what the situation is for you right now. I want to help you to get your mind right, get in the game, because I know it's an adjustment even after a regular summer to get back into the teaching mode. And I also want to talk about some basic steps that we can do to get ahead of things a little bit. Not wanting to push ourselves too hard or get too far ahead, but there are some things we can do to make it easier on ourselves during the year, which is so important as teachers. We have pretty seasonal jobs in general. Different parts of the year just feel and look completely different for us. We have recital seasons and we have certain times of the years when things are hectic and crazy. And then we have times of the years where things shut down quite a bit. And if we're smart, if we're careful, we can use those times to balance things out, to make it that we're not running around like a crazy person and then just collapsing on the couch with exhaustion after it and repeating that cycle on and on forever. What I want to help you do is to map out your year and get ahead on certain things so that you can feel successful and feel more balance, less overwhelmed for the whole of the year. So this starts with getting your mind right before the year even begins. And step one is to do nothing. If you didn't take any proper time off during the summer, I want you to take some now. Doesn't have to be enormous. I'm not expecting you to go on some big holiday, some big vacation. That's not realistic. But You need to have taken some real time off, time where you weren't thinking about your students, time when you weren't secretly doing admin tasks on your phone or checking in with your social media. Real time off. Have you taken any? Get real. Has it actually happened? If it hasn't, I want you to take at least a half a day. That's all I'm demanding of you, a half a day that you actually step away from your work completely. And ideally, do something relaxing. So the definition of relaxing is different for every teacher. I can't dictate what that is. For some, it'll be going canoeing on a lake or, I don't know, skydiving. That will be relaxing to some people. For others, it'll be going to the park, making cookies with their kids, or maybe just sitting in the garden and literally smelling the roses perhaps with a gin and tonic in hand? I think I'd choose that last option. Whatever you do, it needs to be at least a half a day, so at least a few hours, a good solid chunk of time that you step completely away from your work to reset, to zoom out, and to get ready for the year ahead. If you're someone that struggles to take time for yourself, to practice self-care, to look after yourself, basically, then I want you to know that, first of all, it's totally fine to take time for yourself. But secondly, if you do struggle to do this, know that it is essential if you're going to serve other people. You don't just take time for yourself for yourself. Although, as I said, that's perfectly fine as a reason to do it. You take time for yourself in order to serve other people. If you are going to be a fantastic teacher or family member or friend, 
You have to have time to sit back, relax, genuinely relax, so that you can serve others later and so that you have energy stores left to help other people. So that's step one. That's the most important thing. If you haven't done it, please do it. Please put it in your diary right now. Then we'll get into action mode. So what are some things you can do to get ahead of next year so that you have a little bit more time to spare during the year for yourself? Well, if you haven't already set your schedule for the upcoming year, now is the time to do that. That's the obvious one. You're going to need to set up your timetable for your students and make it work. And that takes some time. So that's one of our big jobs for a lot of us in August where we need to sit down with all the preferences from different students and people moving up into secondary schools and all sorts of things that are going on, and we need to schedule our lessons. Sounds simple, but it has to happen. So if it hasn't, that should be your number one priority. The next level in our basic checklist for a new year is to set up your calendar. So timetable is within each week, obviously. The calendar is about what's going to happen during the whole year. So each month, what are the general things that are going to happen? Obviously, with the situation we're in right now, you can't predict all of this, but it doesn't mean you can't put things in place, okay? So if you know that you want to have a performance, a recital of some sort at some stage, put that in. Is it going to happen in March? Is it April? Whether it's online or offline, it's the same time of year, most likely. So put stuff like that in if you have exam seasons or festivals that come up throughout the year, or if you have any exciting projects that you want to put in, you can put that in at this stage as well. This is going to be the calendar, or the information at least, even if you don't share the calendar, it's going to be what you share with piano parents, with parents in your studio. So you put this calendar in place, whether you share the calendar itself publicly, or just the information, you need to have it ready to go, so that you can send things like an introduction email, which is our next step. So introducing the year, welcome to a new year, that kind of email, that's going to need to go out, and I recommend it has some info about exciting stuff that's coming up this year. This is more important now than ever. Get your students and parents in your studio excited. What's going to happen this year that's going to be fantastic? Do you have a concert coming up? Have you prepared them for entry into a festival? Is there any other changes you're making in your studio? You need to tell people about these things so that they can feel involved in the process and excited to be a part of your studio this year. So a few of those details can be sprinkled into a welcome to this year email alongside any information that you need people to know. So if you have specific protocols they need to follow, if you need to remind them about parking or anything, links to certain places, whatever you need to tell your parents. If you already have your schedule set and your calendar, your rough calendar for the year set up, I want you to write this introduction email before you start as well. Welcome to the new year. Write it now. Write it before the year starts. Maybe your year has already started, but even if it has, still worth writing this email. But ideally, it does happen before the year starts because anything, especially written stuff, gets better when you edit it. I know, revolutionary. But it's so true, and so few of us take the time to do it. So if you draft that email now, you're going to have a chance to go back in a week later or two weeks later, and look at it with fresh eyes, having not read it for a while, and edit it and tweak things and change things around. And yes, check for typos, but also just make it even better. A big thing that you learn when you start writing is I've written three books now. And one of the things I had to learn in the beginning, one of the basics is that editing is the most important part. It's not my favorite part. I prefer probably writing the first draft. But editing, going back and self-editing, is the most important bit. That's when your writing really gets better, is that you're editing what you've already written and changing it and tweaking it. So, 
give yourself some time and some space if you can that you can go back later to edit it. Final thing in our basic checklist is to order some books and materials for the year. If you haven't already done this, make sure you're stocked up. What are you going to need roughly for this year or just this semester would do? I go through my bookstores. Now, I order all my books for my students myself. So I give my students all their books, which means that I have a pretty substantial collection at any one time. And it's basically like restocking a shop for me. I need to go through and see what's low in stock. And I go through this and reference the students that I have, that I know I'm going to have, and what their next book is likely to be. Now, with some of them, you're not going to know that, like, because you're going to give them a choice, and that's fine. But for the beginner ones, if they're going to be heading into the next level of a method book, I think they're probably going to move up to level two or whatever or I have a plan to switch their book to a different series, or whatever I have in mind, I'm going to go through and make sure I have enough stock, as it were, to account for that. If you don't provide books for your students, you might not need as much as me, but you still will need some stuff. So you need paper for your printer, you need ink maybe, you don't have a subscription for that, you might need envelopes or folders. Go through and basically stock up your cupboard. (laughs) for your studio with anything that you're likely to need for the next semester. It's really useful to do that in advance and just know that you have stuff on hand and you can reorder as you need to throughout as well. After your basic checklist, which was your schedule, your calendar, your introduction email and your stock cupboard, I want you to map out your year for your own purposes. What is going to happen each month? Roughly. So you can start this with the calendar, but it's going to include extra stuff. So it's not going to be just the recitals and the events that you would tell parents about. It's also going to be special projects you want to do in your studio. Maybe you want to do a composing project together. Maybe you want to do a parent day for everyone to teach them about practice and how they can help their kiddos at home. Maybe you want to put in when you want to send out progress reports to the parents. Any of that kind of stuff that you know needs to happen at some point during the year, pencil it in. You're not committing to these dates, you're not going to tell anyone about them, but if you mark it in, it's going to mean that you can do the next step, which is to prep for those things in previous months. We have up seasons and down seasons within our teaching year, and if you know when stuff is going to happen, you can move some of it back and do the preparation for it in the previous months and it's going to make a big difference to those hectic times. So for example, at the very end of the year, maybe you want to send out reports or progress updates to all the parents. You also want to do a studio newsletter. You also have your recital that month. Well, if you see that onslaught of activity, you can move some of it back and do it in advance in the previous months. But if you don't see it coming and suddenly it's towards the end of the year and you've got all of this stuff to do, it's going to be really stressful. So taking this moment to map out your year and the common things that happen, the unsurprising details, will mean that you can prepare for those things in the months before them, the months leading up to them. The final area that you can look at at this time of year that I think is really valuable is to do with onboarding new students. If you're going to have any new students joining your studio, congratulations. Very exciting time. One thing that's really fantastic to put in place for these new students is a series of emails that goes out to the parents or the students, if you teach a lot of adults, a series of emails to welcome them, to get them on board with how things work in your studio, and to help integrate them into your community culture. I have a sample set of emails for Vibrant Music Teaching members. So if you're a member, you can check out the essential email sequences, essential email templates. Those are in the video library because it's a course to go with it. So you can check those out. You can download those templates or copy paste them and use them as a starting point. There's a big series there and it's a great way to educate parents to make sure everyone starts off on an equal footing whether they studied music before or not, and just give them a fantastic start in your studio. 
The other thing you want to plan for with new students is a little bit of extra time. You need some extra padding for the time you spend with new students. You're going to need to communicate that little bit more with the parents or the students themselves to nurture those initial relationships and it's going to be worth it in the long term. We have long-term relationships with our students, hopefully. Many years, most of us. And so spending that initial extra bit of time in the first few months is so valuable. But we can be running around like headless chickens and therefore not spend the time that's required for that. So budget for it now. If you're going to have a few new students, set aside a weekly spot when you're going to call them or email them, or text them, or post photos, whatever your preferred method is, and it can be a mixture, but set aside a little bit of extra time each week and put it in your diary when you're going to reach out to those parents or those students to make sure everything is going well, and also to just let them know how fantastic their kid is or how great they're doing, right? That little bit of extra attention in the beginning makes a massive difference in the long run. So that's it. Those are the most important things I think you could do right now to get ready for this next year coming. And I'm very excited to hear how it goes for you as you get back into the swing of teaching. I want you to get your mind right, set up your schedule and your calendar, hopefully your introductory email, and order your books and materials and get your supply closet in order. Map out your year to the best of your ability with extra special projects, reports, parent days, anything like that that's going to be coming up and make a plan to prep for those things, for the, especially for the most hectic months when a lot of things are going along. And then lastly, consider your new students if you're going to have some. Do you have an email sequence in place, hopefully an automated one, like we show inside Vibrant Music Teaching? Do you have that sequence in place? so that you can nurture that relationship? And have you set aside some extra time in the initial weeks to follow up with those students and parents, to call them or email them or text them or post some pics of them on social media, on your Instagram, if that's your style, to just give them a little bit of a shout out with permission, of course. Tell me what you're going to do to get your mind right and yourself set up for the new year. You can write to me on Facebook, in our Facebook group, or leave a comment on the show notes for this episode, which you can get to at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 111 for episode 111. So I'd love to hear about that. Please do let me know and let me know if this episode was useful for you. Coming up from next week, we've got a fun new series planned for you. So I hope you enjoyed the last series. This one is going to be completely different. The last few weeks, the last 10 weeks, we've been doing the Vibrant Music Studio 101 series, and I believe you've all been enjoying it. I hope you have, and that it's helped you think differently about a few things. The next series is going to be all about online teaching. And I know what you might be thinking, like, what? You've waited until now to talk about online teaching? What are you doing? Here's the thing. If you don't follow the blog or the membership, or the YouTube channel, you might think I haven't talked about online teaching at all since the beginning of March when I published a bonus episode here on the podcast to let you know about the resources we have available. We have been putting out loads of content to help teachers through the pandemic, through the switch to online teaching, and all the considerations in that regard. What I decided right at the beginning, though, was that I was going to keep the podcast as a little bit of a respite. It was going to be the place where we still talked about general teaching stuff, business stuff, long-term plans, and where people could take a little bit of a break from the onslaught of information about online teaching and sanitization and all of that. I believe for a lot of us, Although we are definitely not out of the woods and nothing is over yet, a lot of us have at least exited panic mode. And so now I think is a good time when we can think about online teaching 2.0, leveling up our online teaching, making it better, making some changes to make it easier on ourselves, upgrading our equipment, all of that stuff. Because 
The initial stages were just about getting comfortable with the situation, making things function well and getting through it without going into panic mode too much or stressing about every little detail. But many of us are not out of the online teaching realm at all. Many of us have decided, I've heard from loads of teachers who have decided, actually they prefer this and they want to do this long term. Or they want to keep it in their studio as a backup option that they use a lot more regularly. Or schools aren't reopened where you are or things aren't safe. For whatever reason, you're going to be continuing online teaching this September, or you think you might be back online teaching soon, right? So there's a lot of different varied circumstances, and while I congratulate all of you who are back to in-person teaching and are thrilled with that, I still think it's important to look at these issues, even if that's the case for you. So we're going to be taking a deep dive into all different aspects of online teaching and how we can get excited about it, do things even better change things that we were doing before, upgrade our equipment if we want to, but not just technically. In terms of actual teaching strategies, how can we do better and how can we make things, do things that we can't even do in person, right? Let's get excited about it. If this is the circumstance we're in, if we're going to be doing some online teaching in some capacity in the future, let's make it the best it can be. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next series of podcasts. It's going to be nine episodes taking us up until the end of October. So first couple of months, basically, of this academic year for me, we're going to be looking at online lessons, all different aspects of them. Our first episode, which comes out next Monday, is going to be about the best equipment for online lessons. So we're going to look at all the stuff, the physical things, the different options, the mics, the cameras, all of that. I shied away from talking about this too much because, number one, I didn't want people to feel like they needed to go buy a bunch of stuff to get started because you absolutely don't need that. And number two, the prices for all of this were skyrocketing, as we're all aware, in March and April and May. So now that that's calmed down, hopefully a little bit, and you might be able to afford to purchase something, and you're not in panic mode, so you're not going to panic buy anything, you're going to consider this more carefully, I want to look at different equipment options because I do have quite a few in my studio and I've tried a lot of different things over the years with the online work I do. So I'm going to run through some different options for you there and how you can upgrade your equipment. And then we're going to continue with this online lesson series after that, looking at different aspects of how we might might upgrade things, how we might create version 2.0, how we might create a leveled up version of our online setup. I hope that you'll tune in even if you're not going to be online teaching at the moment, but obviously if you are not interested in this topic whatsoever, know that you can tune out for a little bit and we will be back to other teaching topics going into November. I hope you enjoyed this show. Don't forget to tell me what you do to get your mind right for a new year and what you're doing right now to get yourself ready for the upcoming year ahead. Even if you're in the middle of the year, if you're even if you're in the opposite hemisphere, let me know what I can help you with, what you're doing to get ready for the new year. Okay? So tell me about that on social media, on Facebook, in our Facebook group, or on the show notes for this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 111. Have a great week ahead and all the best for a wonderful year in 2020 to 2021. Bye for now. If you want to make your online lessons more exciting, right now we have loads of online appropriate games inside Vibrant Music Teaching. Just go to vmt.ninja to sign up today.